Well, I'm sure you've been there where you're searching for something, looking for something, hoping to find whatever it is that you are seeking. Maybe it is a job, or maybe it's the right girl, the right guy to spend, the person you can spend the rest of your life with, or maybe a new vehicle. We were on that adventure a few months ago as we were searching for a new van. Uh, a lot of stress and ups and downs and can be long, hard, and frustrating, but uh, eventually we found a new vehicle uh, to drive. And lately, we've been trying to figure something else out, and that is something has been going uh, number two in our window wells at our house. Uh, we noticed one day uh, there was all this uh, feces, and then the next day there was more, then the next day there was more, and then it was not only in one window well, but then it was in another window well. And we have two of the three of our window wells filled with animal poo, or at least I hope that's what it is. And we're trying to figure out what is defiling our window wells. Like, what is doing this? And so if you're an animal expert, uh, I put this call out at the 915 service, and people responded uh, in mass. They told me what they think it is. So if you're an expert, you can help us out. That'd be uh, great. We'd appreciate that very much, trying to figure out what is happening at our house. And searching, seeking for whatever it is is a part of life. And this morning, we come to the passage in John chapter 1. We find John's disciples, John the Baptist, two of his disciples doing just this. There's this searching, this seeking, this looking. For what? Well, they're searching and seeking for something that was central to the lives of the Jews. And that was the Messiah. This anointed one, this figure that had been promised in the Old Testament who would come and rescue God's people. And even more specifically this morning, seeking to understand if the Messiah was Jesus. There's three scenes in our passage this morning. Scene one, John directs his disciples to Jesus. Scene two, Jesus reveals himself to these searching disciples. And scene three, the disciples introduce others to Jesus. Scene one, John directs his disciples to Jesus. Before we get to Jesus and these disciples, we must start with John the Baptist from whom these disciples come. In verse 35, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. John starts with the next day, indicating this is day three of the first week of Jesus' public ministry. And on day three, the, John the Baptist is standing with two of his followers, two of his disciples. And he's standing there with these men. And Jesus comes their way. Jesus passes by. And John sees Jesus. And this word saw means to look intently at or to gaze upon. John is staring at or gazing intently at Jesus. His eyes are locked on Jesus as Jesus comes to them and passes by them. And I'm sure you've been in a situation before where you're talking with someone, you're in a conversation with them, and all of a sudden their eyes, they're looking at something else. Their eyes are locked on something. And what happens? Well, you turn to look at what they're looking at. Their staring gets your attention and you start to stare. And as John is gazing at Jesus, seeing Jesus, he says this about Jesus, look, the Lamb of God. Look, the Lamb of God. Now you remember the day before, or last week, John the Baptist had made this statement about Jesus. Jesus was approaching John the Baptist, and he says about Jesus, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But on this day, the next day, John is with just two of his disciples, whom we know from verse 40, at least one is Andrew, and more than likely the other is probably the Apostle John, who wrote this gospel. And the reason for that is because he gives days and he gives times, meaning he was an eyewitness to these events. And so more than likely, we have Andrew, and more than likely, we have John, the apostle who wrote this gospel. And these men are with John the Baptist, disciples of John the Baptist. And Jesus is walking by, and John says, the Lamb of God. Now, upon hearing Jesus or John say this to his men, what do they do? Well, verse 37, the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. They heard him say this, John, say, the Lamb of God, and they follow Jesus. They leave John for Jesus. And in doing so, they are doing exactly what John the Baptist wants them to do. So you remember why John is here. John has been preparing them not to follow him, but to follow the one who would come after him, the Messiah, the chosen one. He says, this is, who, this is why I am here. I'm not here so you follow me, but I'm here to prepare the way for the one whom you should follow. See, John, John is uh, get, gathering all these people, all these disciples, to point them to the Messiah, to the one he's preparing the way for. In this scene of John, again, it underscores and highlights the humility of John the Baptist. When you think about who is John the Baptist, we often think he's this preacher calling people to repentance. There's wrath coming, and he's calling them to repent of their sin, to get baptized as a symbol of their repentance of sin. But what we also find about John is John was a man of great humility. 
He's a man of great humility. See, what John is doing is he's sending disciples away from him to Jesus. At this point in his ministry, remember, John has thousands of people following him. He's amassed all these followers, and now he's turning and looking at his followers, and he's saying, telling them to leave him to go to someone else, and that someone else is Jesus. Now, you think about who does that. You know, we live in a world of followers on social media. Uh, many of us have social media accounts, and the objective is to try to get more and more people to follow you, more and more people to look at you, more and more people to give their attention to you. Everyone's trying to get followers, and you don't find uh, very many people who are trying to get followers in order to give their followers to somebody else. That doesn't happen. But John does this. John has accrued all of these disciples, and now he is directing them to Jesus. Why? Well, in part because he is a man of humility. And a humble person does several things, but I just want to highlight two this morning. The humble person, one, obeys God. He obeys God. Philippians 2, chapter 8, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When we think about Jesus, we we should think about humility. That Jesus is the epitome of humility. And what did Jesus do because he was humble? He obeyed. He obeyed his father, and not just when things were easy, when things were going well, but he obeyed his father even to the point of death, of great suffering, of excruciating pain, death on a cross. And this is what John was doing. He was doing what God had told him to do, had sent him to do, to prepare the way for the Lord, to prepare the way for this Messiah. And so John is a man of humility as he obeys the Lord. He submits himself to the Lord's instruction. Second, a humble person does what is best for others. Not only is John obeying God, doing what he told him to do, but he's also doing what is best for others. He's thinking about others. The best thing for people to do is to follow the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why? Well, because they are in need of salvation from their sin. And the whole idea of the Lamb of God is he is the one who has come into the world to take away the sin of the world. Meaning what? To die in the place of sinners like us to pay the punishment for our sins so that we might be reconciled to God. So that we might have salvation, that we might be forgiven of our sin. John knew this. John knew what was best is for them to follow Jesus. In humility, humility, the person who is humble will do what is best for others. Philippians chapter 2 reflects on this. Paul shares this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should not not look to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. That we should not look only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. That we should be thinking about others. The humble person isn't just concerned with himself or herself but also about what's best for those around them. And this is John the Baptist. He wants what's best for his followers. What's best for his followers is to follow the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John, John underscores what it means to be humble. He points his followers to Jesus. And so you have Andrew and John the Apostle. They stand with John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God. Look, behold, the Lamb of God. And Andrew, Andrew and John begin to follow Jesus. This leads us to scene two. Jesus reveals himself to the searching disciples. Verse 38, when Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? What do you want? What are you seeking? I can imagine here, you know, Jesus is passing by John and his disciples, and John makes a statement, behold, the Lamb of God, and they begin to follow. There's this handing off between John the Baptist and Jesus. And these men begin to literally follow Jesus. Like it's not a figurative thing. They literally begin to follow Jesus, walk behind Jesus. And Jesus turns and looks at them and says, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Now, one might wonder, why are you asking that question, Jesus? I mean, don't you already know what they're looking for? Don't you already know what's going on? And the answer, of course, is yes. He already knows what they're looking for. He's God. He's omniscient. He knows all things, including what's in the heart of man. So why is he asking the question, what are you looking for? Well, he's not asking the question for himself, for his own benefit, but for their benefit. See, I think he's asking them to get them to question, to evaluate their own motives for following him. Notice he doesn't ask, who are you looking for, but what are you looking for? What are you in search of? What is it that you're really after in life? 
that Jesus is getting straight to the heart, the motives of the heart. In fact, one commentator wrote, he is probing them to find out whether they were motivated by idle curiosity or by a real desire to know him, to really know him. See, Jesus is looking for genuine followers, people who really want to know him and follow him. And so this question isn't just for these men, but it's for any person who is really making any attempt to follow Christ. Do you really want to know me? Do you want to know what is true? Are you in search of me? You can think about your own life. What is it that you really are in search of? You know, why are you here this morning? Do you want to genuinely know Christ? And you watch how Andrew and John respond to Jesus' question. It's interesting, they respond by asking a question themselves. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Where are you staying? Now that's a little bit of an odd answer. Not only does it not answer the question of what are you looking for, but it just seems kind of odd, out of place. The first thing they ask Jesus is, where are you staying? Where are you staying? Where are you going? And when you think about it for a moment, I don't think it seems weird. It might be that they're nervous, intimidated, and so it just kind of comes out weird. But I think it communicates their true intentions, which were what? They wanted to be with Christ, to know Christ. They're seeking to know Jesus. That One, they call him rabbi, which literally means my great one, a sign of great respect. And then they're asking him, where are you staying? Indicating, I think, we want to know you. We want to go and be with you. See, even in that time of day, it's 4 p.m., John tells us, things are shutting down. They should go find a place to stay. And rather than going and finding a place to stay, they want to stay with Jesus. They want to be with Jesus. And why do they want to be with Jesus? Because they want to have time with Jesus. Because I think they genuinely want to know Jesus. They are sincere seekers of Jesus. And that desire, that sincerity, seems to be affirmed by Jesus when he says to them in verse 39, come and you will see. Come. Come. And you will see. Jesus doesn't say, just get away from me. He doesn't say, uh, maybe another time. He doesn't say, no, just get out of here or ignore them altogether. Jesus says, no, come. Come with me. Come with me. And what did they do? Well, they went and they saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him for that day. And it was about four in the afternoon. And so the implication is they stay overnight with Jesus. Now, If you stay overnight with people, um, oftentimes what happens? You have conversation, you talk. It's not like you typically just kind of go your own ways. Um, Every once in a while, I have a buddy who stays with me. He comes out of town and he uh, has to uses my house to stay in our basement. We have a bedroom that's basically designated for him at this point in time. And every time he comes, we end up getting into conversations. I'm like, we talk for hours and hours and hours about theological things, about political things, about whatever life. And we just get in these long conversations. And it's like it just happens every single time to the point I'm like, bro, I'm like, I got to go to bed. I got to get up early and you got to go to bed. Like, we got to go to bed. Because that's what people do. You have someone over, you stay with them and you talk, you converse. And what was the result then of this conversation with Jesus and these disciples? Well, verse 41, uh, Andrew says, we have found the Messiah. These men walked away convinced that they had found the Messiah, the anointed one. That Jesus was the one that John had been preparing the way for. That what John was saying was in fact right. He is the one, the anointed one. The one that the prophets had spoken of. And then when Jesus invited these men to come stay with him. It was more than just come, you know, hang out with me. It was more than just kind of, you know, here's my, here's my house. Of which Jesus probably didn't even have. He's inviting them to come and see him, to know him. As one commentator said, to gain insight from him into the mind and the purpose of God himself, that he's inviting them in to see who he actually is, that he is the Messiah, the one that they have been waiting for, that the prophets had spoken of, that they had centered their lives on as Jews. And now John the Baptist is, is here and all this hustle and bustle about John being the Messiah, John's like, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm preparing the way for him. And John's saying, he's the one. And these men, they go to Jesus, and in their heart of hearts, they're wondering, is he the one? In their heart of hearts, they want to know, is he the one sincerely seeking Jesus? And so there's this glorious truth and principle 
that we find here, which is this, when someone sincerely seeks after Jesus, Jesus will reveal himself. Jesus will reveal himself to the person who sincerely, genuinely wants to know him, that wants to know truth, that's a seeker of truth. Later on in the Gospel of John, verse 17 of John 7, says, if anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. How will you know the teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own? If you want to know, if anyone wants to do his will, they're sincerely seeking, pursuing Christ. And see, the honest seeker, the sincere seeker, the one who is genuinely searching for truth, to know Jesus will find Jesus. One pastor said, Jesus never put off the sincere spirit-prompted seeker. He was never too busy to show compassion for lost sheep who are seeking a shepherd. And we see this in many places. One of those, again, is with a man named Zacchaeus. Do you remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man Zacchaeus? The tax collector, the outcast of society, was extorting money from his own people. Jesus comes to town. All these people are lining up to see Jesus. Jesus is, or Zacchaeus is there. He's too short to see around all the crowd of people, to see over them, to see Jesus. And he's determined to see Jesus. And so what does he do? He does what a Jewish man would never do. He climbs this tree. And he gets up there to see Jesus. He's so desperate. He wants to see Jesus. And he wants Jesus to see him. And in Luke 19, Jesus comes to this place and he looks up as though the only other person around amongst this crowd of people is Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and hurry and come down because today it's necessary for me to stay at your house, to be with you. This man seemed to be a sincere seeker of truth, of Christ. And when someone is sincerely seeking Jesus, they will find Jesus. The principle is throughout the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter four. But from there, you will search for the Lord your God And you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. Prophet Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. All your heart. These men were seeking Jesus with their heart. And Jesus will honor the sincere seeker by revealing himself to them. But on the other hand, he will not commit himself to those who are insincere, those who are hypocritical. And we see this throughout the scriptures as well. No matter what their outward profession of faith might be. You have all these religious leaders who just try to trap Jesus, to discredit Jesus, and Jesus does not reveal himself to them. You see, these men, Andrew and John and many others, sincerely sought Christ. That on that day when Andrew and John went to Jesus to follow Jesus, and Jesus welcomed them to the place he was staying, they go to be with Jesus, and more than likely, like on the, the road to Emmaus, as Jesus does with the disciples after he resurrects in Luke chapter 24, More than likely, he goes to the scriptures and he interprets for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. See, what do the scriptures point to? Moses, the prophets, the whole Old Testament, they're all pointing to Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus opens their mind to understand that what they have been told, what they have been reading, what they have been searching for, for so long, is found right there in front of them in Christ. That by God's grace, they saw Jesus for who he was, which was an experience that changed their entire life, shifted the course of their life. And so much so that they wrote down the time. I mean, John, assuming this is John who had this experience, who is also with Andrew, says that it's at 4 p.m., right? On the third day of the first week of Jesus' ministry. This, this moment, this time with Jesus was forever burned into their minds, etched into their memory. And as Christians, if you're a believer in Christ, you probably have those moments where you've experienced God and you've become so clear-minded on something that you ought to do that God just makes it clear this is what you should do or makes it very clear that you're walking in sin and you need to repent and follow him. You have these moments that are just forever burned into your brain. I still won't forget the day when it just became very clear to me, okay, Lord, what God wanted me to do as 19 years old, 2003. It was at a conference in Colorado. I remember walking out from a session teaching. The pastor was teaching about following Christ. And if you want to follow Christ, you need to surround yourself with people who are on fire for Christ. And 
I wanted to follow Christ. I was convinced that's what I should do, but I was not around people who were really following Christ. The school I was at at the time, I didn't have Christian relationships, people who were sincerely, genuinely seeking Christ. I remember walking outside in Colorado, the church, and it became so clear to me. It's like, it's like as though God spoke to me, though he did not, but it just became so crystal clear in my mind. I'm like, you need to move back to Des Moines and you need to be with these men and women who are following Christ at this church. I was with a number of guys from our church at that time. And it, it was like, it was, it was so clear what God wanted me to do. And it's one of those turning points in my life, one of those moments in my life that my life has never been the same since that point in time. And these men had that type of moment. So it would seem that they forever etched into their mind was this moment when they came to realize, oh, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You're the one the prophets, Moses, have all been talking about, who we've been hearing about, who we've been searching for. Now, what do these men do? Well, scene three, the disciples introduce others to Jesus. Andrew, John, spend the night with Jesus, spend time conversing with Jesus, walked away convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, lives forever changed. Now what? Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. You know, throughout the Gospels, this is how Andrew is identified as Simon Peter's brother. Simon Peter's brother. Now, some of you, you live in that world in the shadow, if you will, of your older sibling. You're identified by being the brother or the sister of so-and-so. Uh, my youngest son, Brooks, I have three boys, and my youngest son, Brooks, is uh, almost 14, I think, 13, so he's going on 14. And uh, my other son, older son, McCabe, 15. Brooks was uh, playing on McCabe's baseball team for a tournament. He was uh, subbing in for him. And on the team, <clears throat> his nickname for that weekend was Mini Hookie. Mini Hookie. Not Luke Hookie. Mini Hookie, though. And they identified him as what? The Mini, the, the younger brother of McCabe. And this is how some of you, you, you are known in your life. You're the brother of so-and-so, or so-and-so is your brother or sister. But it isn't always that bad, because Andrew here, when you look at Andrew... Andrew is the one who introduces his brother, Peter, who is more known to Jesus. Verse 41, he first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah. I've tried to imagine this scene. You gotta think that Andrew is just excited. Like he's overjoyed, this look of amazement on his face. And he goes to his brother, Peter, whom he loves, he cares about, they're close, and he says, we have found the Messiah, Peter. Peter, can you believe it? We have found him, who we've been searching for and looking for. And I'm not overselling the excitement that they would have or the anticipation and the energy that was given to looking and waiting for the Messiah. This was a big deal. And so Andrew has this experience where he comes to this realization where Jesus makes clear to him he is the Messiah and he goes straight, if you will, to his brother Peter and says, Peter, we have found him. And he doesn't just say, Peter, we found him and move on with life. But he brings him to Jesus. And he brought Simon to Jesus. In fact, this is what Andrew, in one sense, is known for in the Gospels. And it's a pretty good thing to be known for is bringing people to Jesus. John 6, he's the one who brings the boy who has the five uh, loaves of bread and the, the two fish, whom Jesus multiplies to feed the thousands. Andrew brings him to Jesus. This boy experiences the miraculous power of Jesus. John chapter 12, there's some Greeks that are at a festival, and, and they went up to Philip, and they wanted to see Jesus, and it was Andrew who brought them to Jesus. Now, if that's your reputation in the Bible, it's a good reputation to have of bringing people to Christ. And see, when you find something that you are in search of, you tell others about it. You share it with them. When you experience something good, something that changes your life, you want other people to experience that also. You have no problem telling them about it. And Simon goes with his brother to meet Jesus. He goes with Andrew to meet Jesus, and the scene closes with an interesting uh, statement that Jesus makes about Peter in verse 42. He says, when Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. 
You are Simon, son of John. I mean, Jesus knows him. He knows exactly who he is. You're Simon, son of John. And then he says this, you will be called Cephas or Cephas, which is translated Peter, which we all know means rock. That in this moment, as Peter comes to Jesus, Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter. Now, what is going on here? Well, there are a number of other instances in the Bible where people's names change. Abraham, or Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter, Saul to Paul. And oftentimes these names or changes in names were also connected to a special kind of calling, indicating who they were, their identity. Genesis chapter 17 with Abraham, you will no longer be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I will make you the father of many nations. That God changes Abram's name to Abraham to indicate who he will become. He will become this father of many nations, ultimately through Christ. That Jesus came through the line of Abraham. And so when Jesus sees Simon, he doesn't merely see him in the sense of he just recognizes that he's there. But he saw him, who he was, who he become, whom he would mold Peter into. That over time, Jesus would transform Peter, his character, his life. He was the rock. That he become the foundational, one of the foundational leaders of the church. That in changing his name, he was indicating whom he would be transformed into. That he would be this rock of civility for Christ. And here's the truth. That in Jesus, if you know Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus, you also have a new identity. As Jesus says, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That you are loved by God, forgiven by God, chosen by God, son and daughter of God, conqueror over sin, death and Satan. You belong to God and nothing can change that. That you are new in Christ. That your identity is not found and where you came from. It's not found in necessarily what you do, but it's found in someone in Christ. And because of Christ, you are a new creation. And you belong to God. You have a new identity. And Jesus will complete the task that he started in you. He saved you and he will bring you to completion, which is what? To conform you into the image of of himself, that ultimately one day we will be made like Christ. We will, we will have, uh, what Paul talks about how we'll be transformed from the bodies that we have into the bodies like Christ, where we shed away this body of sin, where we'll be fully conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We look ahead forward to that day for those of us who know Jesus. In closing then, in this passage is two applications, two questions. First is this, is what are you looking for? When you think about Jesus and following Christ, he asked them this question, what are you after? What are you searching for? And you think about your own life, what are you after in life? What do you want? We go after so many things, but really they're ultimately getting to some deeper thing, which is this idea of what we really want is life, joy, contentment, peace, hope that won't disappoint, purpose. And that life is possible, but only found in one place, in one person, Christ. And if you're here this morning and you sincerely want to know Christ, you're looking for truth, welcome. Jesus will reveal himself to you. That he is where life is found. He is where hope is found. And to those who sincerely seek him, want to know him, he will reveal himself to them. Second, who can you introduce to Jesus? Who can you introduce to Jesus? Just think about this passage for a moment. You have John the Baptist who introduces his disciples to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God. After meeting with Jesus, Andrew and John convinced he is the Messiah. And what do they do with that information, with that news? Well, they don't keep it to themselves. They don't keep to themselves what they had found, what they had discovered, but they share it. Simon 
or Andrew immediately goes to his brother Simon, Peter, and tells him about Jesus. He tells him about Jesus, brings him to Jesus. See, this is the natural response to finding Jesus, to experiencing Christ. It's to tell others about Christ. The, the nature of the Christian experience is that those who have experienced God's grace desire to share that experience of God's grace with others. And this is what we see with Andrew throughout the scriptures. We find this with others. That those who find Christ or are found by Christ, as we'll see next week, introduce others to Christ. Those who have experienced the life-changing power of Christ tell others about Christ. Why would we not tell others about Christ? See, the Christian faith is something to be shared, to be communicated, not kept to ourselves. Christianity is not this private religion. It's a public one. Proclaiming to the world what Christ has done. And if we've experienced Christ, if we've experienced the forgiveness that is found in Jesus, that burden of sin has been removed, that no longer will we experience the wrath of God toward our sin, but rather we are welcomed into the kingdom of God through the blood of Christ. How can we not tell others? If we've experienced the joy of salvation, why would we not want to communicate that joy of salvation to others? We share Many of the things that are much, much less exciting, much, lef, much less life-changing to other people all the time. See, the Christian faith is to be a faith that's shared with others. These men, they told others. More than likely, John went and told his brother James, and they brought others to meet Jesus. So who can you tell? Who can you bring? Who can you introduce to Jesus? You have friends, you have coworkers, family members, classmates, teammates. Who around you doesn't know Christ that you could begin to introduce to Christ? You don't have to be weird about it. Or maybe you can be, whatever you want. I don't know. But just begin conversations. I love the principle. Jesus invites them and come and see. Come and see that what we should do is we should invite people and come and see. Not that we're perfect. Not that we have it all figured out, but come and see. Come be with me so I might introduce you to Jesus. You don't have to tell them that's what you're doing, but that's what's going on. Evangelism, introducing people to Christ. The most, one of the most effective ways to bring people to Jesus. It's not through the crusades and all the, the preaching from the pulpits, though that does work, but it's oftentimes just simply by one-on-one -on -one conversations, through relationships, through people you know, through people who you're just normally around. And see, we want to be a church that is known for introducing people to Jesus. Otherwise, wh what are we doing? Think about what, what are we doing? Do you ever just stop and ask yourself, why am I here as a Christian? If, if I know Christ and I'm going to be with Christ, why am I not just up there already with him? Well, because he's left you here to tell others about what he has done for you in hopes that they might see and believe in him. And that's why we want to be a church that is introducing people to Christ. And so who can you, who can you introduce to Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.